Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Yes. Man, I'm excited. Um, I, in our prayer time this morning, um, somebody was praying over me, and uh, they, they made a statement, and I, and I really connected with it. And they made the statement that it seems like God's up to something. It seems like God's fixing to do something. And, uh, you know, that excites me in so many ways because I really do believe that. And in fact, as he was praying over me this morning saying, I believe God's getting ready to do something. I believe God's getting ready to break something out. Um, I, I just, man, something in my heart says yes. Something says, God, I want that. In fact, um, I, 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 I'm really excited about where we're going uh, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, before I do that, I, I do want to give you an update. We didn't do this last week on Easter Sunday, but uh, I so uh, appreciate Rhonda and Alan leading our team this morning. Alan's one of our elders. Amen. And... Uh, but I want to give you an update, as you guys may or may not know, some of you may not have been here a few weeks ago, Mark and Julie resigned and took a position down in South Tyler as a senior pastor. And I mentioned on that Sunday that we let you know that they were resigning. Um, that we are connecting with Gateway up in Dallas and uh, that we just sang one of their songs and uh, they're going to be coming and working with us, our band and our singers uh, starting in July. And we're going to do a three month commitment with them where they're going to come in and develop new singers, new uh, help our singers kind of uh, learn to lead. And uh, our goal is that we develop several different folks that are able to lead out front. And so we're real excited about that, but I want to keep you updated on what we're doing between now and then, we're going to have some different folks fill in for us, and they're helping us uh, bring different people in to work with our band. Uh, Curtis Grimes, as you guys saw him last week, uh, you may see him again up here with his band, uh, just working with some different folks to help us in this transition period, because we believe that God called Mark there. We also, because God called him there, God's got something for us here, and that's why there seems to be kind of this excitement. Um, and so let me connect some dots for you. Uh, over this last year and why I think that God's doing some really cool stuff. If you remember back in January, we started a series on maturity and we started in John chapter 12 and we started working through John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We spent almost nine weeks talking about what Jesus was telling his disciples and, and, and we worked through the book of John. When we finished that series, we then went into this series called Insta Jesus where we started looking at some pictures of Jesus. And, and while we didn't just continue in John chapter 18, 19, and 20, what we've done is we've actually stayed in the book of John and we've looked at these pictures of Jesus. We've looked at these uh, faces of Jesus that he is a, a lover and he loves us, but he's also a warrior that he, he is warring for our hearts and he's, and he's pursuing us and chasing us down. And, and it's just mind boggling to me that God is warring for our hearts and he's a man enough and, and, and a God enough to come after us. And then last week we looked at he is the king, that he is the one who is risen, that he's the only man 
man in history that's ever predicted and pulled off his death and resurrection. And for that alone, he's the king. And then today we're going to be looking at he is our friend. But here's what I'm excited about it because I don't, maybe you didn't realize this, but from January until today, we've pretty much been in the book of John. And then Danielle this morning during our worship time read what happened after Jesus spent 40 days on the earth. And he appeared to those 515 different people on earth. And, and after 40 days, they, he's ascended into heaven. And you remember what she read a while ago? She, here's what he said. He goes, guys, in a couple days, everything's about to change because the Holy Spirit's coming on you. And so here's why I'm excited. Because starting next week, we're going to jump in to that passage. And we're going to be talking about what does it mean to be naturally supernatural? Does God still do miracles? Does God still heal? Does God still do those things we saw in the New Testament or did they stop? And I'm gonna go ahead and give you a preview. I don't believe they stopped. I believe God is still doing the supernatural. And so we're gonna be looking at that of what it means to be naturally supernatural beginning next week. So don't miss next week, okay? Keep coming back for the month of May. We're gonna spend the whole month of May just talking about a holy awakening. What would it mean if we didn't put God in a box? and we just let him have full control in our journey. What would happen? I'm excited, amen? Today, friend, we're gonna talk about what it means to be a friend. And um, I, I, I kinda wanna start with this because yeah, making friends these days is different. Now, you guys know I don't have Facebook, right? And uh, so, uh, I'm a creeper, okay? So what that means is, is my wife has Facebook, and so I log into hers, and I see what y'all are doing, okay? And uh, so I hadn't been on Facebook in about two weeks, and I got on there this morning about five o'clock, and some of you need to repent. <laughs> okay, you're a bunch of sinners, all right? No, I'm just kidding. No, not really. You are. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so here's what I've learned. Uh, and because and friend, this word friend has become a cheap word because you know nowadays the only, the only thing you need to do to be friends with somebody is what? Click a button, right? And then all of a sudden we're friends. And what, here's what's strange about that friendship is that that friendship, we are allowing people to be voyeurs in our life. And yet you wouldn't allow someone in your life to come to your house and be voyeurs in your windows, but you'll do it online all day long, Amen. right? It's creepy, isn't it? That's why I don't have it. I just, I'm a creeper. I get on Danielle's and look at y'all. So, uh, you know, see, friendship is cheap, man. It doesn't take much to be friends anymore. And, and here's why this is important, because see, for many of us, we know who Jesus is. We know that he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, the son of God, Emmanuel. But sometimes I think we forget that he's also our friend. And maybe you grew up like I did. Maybe you grew up in a very traditional setting that, that where God was kind of out there and, and God was coming in here and he, and, but he was still the king, but there was not this idea of friend. But somewhere along the journey in the last 50 years and last 45 years is that we've kind of transitioned that, that, that relationship with Jesus is personal. It's personal. That he is a perfect example of friendship. In fact, we've been using these qualities over the last couple of months or when we're talking to people about coming to knowing Jesus and coming to Christ and they'll come to us and go, hey man, I think I'm ready to get saved or hey man, I want to get baptized. And, and see, a lot of us confuse baptism with salvation. Baptism is like this wedding band. It, it literally, if I take this wedding band off, it doesn't mean I'm not married. I'm still just as married to this woman as I was 30 seconds ago when the band is on. The band is only an outward symbol of an inward commitment. So when I put this on, I'm letting all the ladies know this this hunk of man right here is off the market amen <laughs> did I get that right baby okay <laughs> baptism is an outward symbol of an inward commitment and see so what we've been asking people is is look if you're going to become a Christ follower right then what are those things you admire most about Jesus because if you don't have anything you admire about Jesus how can you follow him because if we're going to imitate someone, then we got to know a little bit about him, right? The fact that Jesus was loyal and brave and humble and honest and compassionate and protective and encouraging and, and dependable and faithful and kind and loving and, and forgiving and completely sacrificial, that he's our lover, he's our friend, he's our warrior, that he is our king. Jesus wants to be our friend, and he's a great friend. 
However, let me say this, because somewhere along the journey in this whole deal about us being in a personal relationship with Jesus, I need to say this, because somewhere along the journey, we need to understand that while God is our friend and Jesus is our friends, we are not equals with God. It is not an equal relationship. Somewhere along the journey, I, it used to be when I was doing student ministry 20, 25 years ago, that it was a cool thing to say, Jesus is my homeboy. No, he's not. Can I just say that? Jesus is not your homeboy. He's your king. He's your king. He's still set apart. And I don't walk up to my daddy and go, dad, you're my homeboy. Because my daddy would knock me back an inch and I'm nearly 50, amen? Because there's still a respect there. You see, Jesus is and always will be our king, yet it's true that our king has invited us to be friends with him. And this is huge. He said in John 15, chapter 15, look at it, verse 15, he said this, no longer do I call you servants, but I have called you what? Friends. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? He didn't tell his disciples, listen, boys, I'm no longer going to be your Lord. Now we're going to be, no, 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 no. He was saying, guys, you've been with me for three years. You've walked with me. You've gone to school with me. You've done that. It's graduation time now, boys. It's graduation time. Because now you've heard me speak what only the Father has given me. And now it's time for you to be invited in. You're no longer servants. You're now my friend. I remember growing up that... Uh, there are certain guys in my journey along the way, my mentors and coaches and, and different people like that. And, you know, there's certain people in my journey that, that uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm always going to call them coach. You know, you know what I'm saying? There was this guy years ago when I was in ninth grade, his name was Vic. And Vic had come to our school and, and, and he took us to an FCA conference that summer because he went to our church and they joined our church. And, and so when he introduced himself, he's like, hey, my name is Vic Nival. And I said, that's great, Mr. Nival, Vic, what do I call you? He goes, oh, just call me Vic. And so we hung out all summer long and, and just showed up for two a days. And there was Vic Nival as my coach, defensive coordinator. And I was like, uh, I can't call him Vic because there's certain respect that comes with coach. I think about Coach Boyd, who's sitting in the back, one, who's a really good friend of mine, and I cherish his friendship. But to this day, I can't call him Jason. You want to know why? He's coach. There, there's something, and, and he's looking at me right now over his glasses. And there's something about him. I love him, but he will always be coach to me. A good friend of mine named Hal Roberts was my head football coach in high school. And, and, and since we've grown up, and I'm nearly 50 years old now, uh, we've become really good friends over the last few years. And, and he'll come to my house and sit in my garage, and, and that's where we hang out, out in my garage, and, and we'll visit. But to this day, I can't call him Hal. It's coach. You see, the friendship, even though there's a friendship there where we're close, it happens that there's esteem for a lifetime. And see, that's the way it is with Jesus. And when Jesus gives his contrast and he wants, and he, he desires to be in friendship with us, that he wants us to be near him and in his heart, don't mistake that and he's no longer your king. He's still the king. And he showed his friendship to his disciples by confiding in them. And he's inviting us into that same relationship. He's inviting us into that same relationship. But let me tell you about how friendship works with God. Because there's three things you need to understand. And, and I want to lay this out before we look into the Old Testament of, of a picture of friendship. Number one, you have to be befriended by God. And this is really important for some of you to understand. Because some of you think you just morph into being a Christian. Okay? Here's the truth. Nobody starts out in life as a friend of God. Did you know that? You were not born a friend of God. Because of sin, because of the sin nature, all the way back in Genesis, you and I were born into sin. And the reason we were born into sin is because our Adam and Eve, our forefathers, sinned. And so therefore, all of us now are sin. And so when you were born, you were born into sin. That's why Jesus came, so that you and I could be saved and be a friend of God. It's not us befriending God. It's God befriending us through Jesus. So that's the first thing about friendship. Here's the second thing. When you are in a relationship with God, you actually talk to him. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Because there's a whole generation being raised right now that will not look you in the eye and have a conversation because they would rather look through a screen and have a conversation with you. 
Listen, when you're in a relationship with God, I am not your mediator. Can I just say that? I'm not Catholic. I'm not a priest. You have a relationship with God that you communicate with God. That's what it means to be in relationship. That you are actually carrying on a conversation with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the warrior lover and your friend having a conversation. But here's, a, here's, here's the last thing I would say about relationship. It's an incredible privilege to be friends with the King of Kings. Now let me ask you a question. You see, Jesus is calling us to be his friend, not just servants. Can you imagine if the president of the United States, maybe not this one, maybe one in the past, maybe one in the future, I don't want to offend anybody, okay? But can you imagine if the president of the United States called you and said, hey, I want you to come up to the White House and you're going to stay in the Lincoln bedroom. Would you f think that's pretty cool? I would. I don't care if he's Democrat, Republican. I don't care if he's an idiot. I, I would go, amen? <laughs> the most powerful man in the world's invited me. I mean, I would be in the Lincoln bedroom taking pictures going, Lincoln bedroom, I'm here. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> Hashtag you're jealous, amen? <laughs> yeah, you'd strut it around. You'd be totally stoked. He got me in the Lincoln bedroom. Dude, it's awesome. That's what it's like to be in a relationship with God, except it about a thousand times better, a thousand times more powerful, that he has invited us. What a privilege. It blows my mind of the privilege it is that God's invited us to be in a relationship with him. Now, I wanna show you a picture in the Old Testament and there's this great story uh, in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because if you don't know this, let me just teach you something real quick. Everything in the scripture points to Jesus. Even at the end of the book, it points back to Jesus, but also in the New Testament, it's pointing to Jesus coming back. So everything in scripture is Christocentric. So when we look back into the Old Testament, everything is pointing towards Jesus. And I know some of you read the Old Testament, you're going, I don't have a clue. And what about that animal and cutting the heads off? And sending it to four, I don't know. Listen, I'm not saying it's not weird, okay? Some of you need to understand that. Some preachers get up here and teach the Old Testament like it's not weird. It's weird, okay? It's in the Old Testament. Listen, you can't divorce the Old Testament from the New Testament. And there's some guys that want to divorce the Old Testament from the New Testament. Listen, I don't think everything in the Old Testament is applicable uh, to us today, but I do believe that it is inspired to give us a picture of God. So when we look back in the Old Testament, we're looking for Christ in the, New, in the Old Testament that's pointing to the coming Christ. And we know that he's coming back. What's what Danielle just read while ago in Acts chapter one. And so I love the Old Testament because it gives us pictures of God. And there's this story in the Old Testament found in first Samuel. It's dealing with David and Jonathan and their relationship that, that David was this young man who was chosen to be king. If you know the story, David and his brothers were out at war. He goes out to war to take care of his brothers. He's delivering some Lunchables to his brothers so they can eat and giving his dad a report while he's out there. There's this giant called Goliath. Goliath, who's out there mocking Israel. And David shows up on the scene. And Saul's back here scared to death. Saul was the king of, of, of Israel at this time. He was a wimp. He was a terrible leader. So he's back here scared to death. David's looking at this guy coming out, defaming the name of God, defaming Israel. And David goes, look, guys, are, are you not going to do anything? And so you know the story. David goes out there and <laughs> kills him, falls him dead. Didn't just kill him. He goes out and cuts the dude's head off. <laughs> Braveheart. I mean, just beautiful scene, man. I know some of you are like, that's in the Bible? Go read your Bibles, okay? It's incredible. So right after that, King Saul, he, I mean, King Saul's now thinking, who is this teenager, right? And so he figures out, hey, this is David. So he has this conversation with David, and we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to look at the friendship that David made with Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son, the heir of the throne of Israel, and I want to show you this picture of friendship, and then I want to correlate that into what Jesus does for us today. Let's start in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. It says, after David had finished talking to Saul, remember he had just killed Goliath, now Saul's having a conversation with him. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. 
From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not return him or let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Now, I want you to notice a couple things in this passage because it's twice in this passage that Jonathan says Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. And it led to a covenant being formed between them. And so it took Jonathan to give his robe and his sword and his belt and his bow. And it just wasn't kind on Jonathan's part. Here's what Jonathan was doing. Jonathan had just seen David deal with Goliath. Jonathan had just witnessed the conversation with David and Saul. Jonathan was a legitimate successor and heir to the throne. Here's what Jonathan did. Jonathan literally laid down his rights. This big. He laid down his rights and his, um, um, his, his opportunity to be the next king of Israel and gave that to David. Now, this is huge. Can you see Jesus in this? For you guys that grew up in church, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Remember, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus. It's Christocentric. So here we fast forward to Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, 27, and 28. It says this, when Jesus took the cup, he gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant. Again, Jesus is forming a new covenant. It's no longer the old covenant based on what we do and God uh, us performing for God. It's now a new covenant that Jesus is making with us, and he says, which is poured out on many for the forgiveness of sins. See, like Jonathan, Jonathan made a covenant with David, Jesus laid aside everything that was rightfully his. That Jesus was everything, he was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and Jesus laid aside what was rightfully his and chose to come be one of us. Why? So that you and I could enter into the new covenant. Isn't that a thing of beauty? Y'all with me? You track me? Am I talking too fast? Am I too loose here? You with me? Okay. Talk to me here. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, again, even though he had everything, yet for our sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we may become what? Rich. See what Jonathan did? Jonathan took and became poor so that David could become poor what God had destined him to become. You and I, through the poverty of Jesus, have now been made rich based on what he did. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, because you are sons or daughters, so you can just plug that in there if you're a lady, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son or daughter. And since you are a son or a daughter, God has made you also an heir. That Jesus literally laid aside what was rightfully his. Why? So that you and I could step into his place and become an heir to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Isn't that incredible? That's a pretty good friend, isn't it? Let's look at the second thing. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 20, let's read on in the story. There's something about David and Jonathan that, that you're going to see over and over again is that David always had Saul going after him. Because here's what happened. Let's look at it. It says that verse, uh, first thing, the 20, 30 through 33 says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan. And he said to him, you, <laughs> you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I, the first time I read that and I read it out loud, I went, it sounds like I'm cussing. Listen to that again. You son of a perverse. It actually says that. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I mean, every time I say it, I feel like I'm cussing. I almost feel kind of like I need to confess something here. But um, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't you know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse, talking about David, lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now, send and bring him to me for he must die. Saul was asking for David's life. Why should he be put to death? What has he done, Jonathan asked. But Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. The friendship that we see here between Jonathan didn't stop at just laying his, his rights aside. 
Jonathan was even willing to give his life. Can you imagine appealing to the king of Israel the way Jonathan did after the king just talked to you that way? And Jonathan still right in the middle of that, in the midst of that anger that Saul throws his spear and tries to kill Jonathan, that Jonathan's loyalty and love literally placed his life at risk that he could lose his own life by defending David. I mean, this is incredible. It's an incredible picture of the true friendship of Jesus Christ, like Jonathan, who Jesus was willing to lay his life down for us. And Jesus didn't just say it, he backed it up and did it. In John chapter 15, verse 13, it says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jonathan, who bore the hatred of Saul, Jesus bore the hatred of mankind so that the very people who hated him could be saved by his sacrifice. That's you and me. That Jesus bore that, that is a friend, that he laid his life down for you and I. It's one of the greatest stories. It's also one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament about the suffering Messiah and how much he has invited us to be his friend. Listen to Isaiah 53, three through five. It says, Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and was esteemed him not. And surely he took up our affirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. I don't know about you, but that's a good friend. That's what Jesus did for us. You see, a friend lays down his rights. Jonathan did and Jesus did. And a friend lays down his life. Jonathan did and Jesus did. But a friend also intercedes. Look at what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 19. There's a common theme here. In 1, chapter, this is 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 6, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. Do you, can I just explain something to you here? You're gonna, you've noticed over and over again in the story, Saul's always chasing David, Right? It seems like there's always somebody trying to kill David, and it's always Saul. By the way, that's true of us as well, because you were born into sin. And guess what sin wants to do to you? It wants to kill you. It's chasing you down. Some of you have been chased down by it, amen? Some of you are feeling this Saul breathing down your neck. Some of you have felt Saul breathing on your neck last night. So Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David, but Jonathan was fond of David and he warned him, my father, Saul, is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are and I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. So Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He's not wronged you. And what, has he, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed that Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel. And you saw it and you were glad. When then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? So Saul listened to Jonathan. And he took an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So here's Saul breathing down David's neck, coming after him, plotting to kill him. And Jonathan comes to David's aid and he begins to intercede and plead for David's life to be spared. And in this case, Saul listened to his son. Unfortunately for David, Saul was not a man of his word. And Saul didn't keep his word. And Saul went again and started pursuing David and trying to kill David. But even in his earthly ministry, we see Jesus, just like Jonathan, we see Jesus also interceding for us. That great story of where Jesus told Peter in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, where he told Peter, listen, Peter, I prayed for you. The enemy's asked to sift you. And so I prayed for you. In other words, I've already interceded on your behalf. I've already asked my daddy. I've already asked my father for you to do well in this. And Jesus was already interceding for us even while he was on the earth. And his present role today is now that what we just read in Acts chapter 1, he's now been with the father, he's sitting by the father, and now he's interceding on our behalf. Amen? 
I love Hebrews 7 says, therefore he is able to save completely because he always lives to intercede before them. He's interceding for us. Romans 8 says he is at the right hand of God and he's also interceding for us. Now listen, his intercession is not trying to turn away God's wrath from believers. And some of you need to hear this because some of you believe that God's mad at you. Okay, now listen to me. God's wrath was poured out at the cross. It was complete at the cross in fact, I don't even comprehend what I'm about to say to you, and I'm a paid Christian professional, and I get paid to think about this stuff all week. You ready for this? I don't even know how to comprehend that when the Scripture says it gave God pleasure to crush him so that you and I could be made right with him. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to wrap my head around that. Here's what I know, is that Jesus Christ left all that was his to come and live with us, to lay his life down for us, and three days later, to take his life back and raise from the dead so that you and I, through him, could be made right with God. And today, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father going, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. That's my son. Don't mess. Daddy, help him persevere. Listen, he's not mad at you because the wrath of God has been settled between him and believers. Amen? So God's not mad at you. That does not mean he won't discipline us, right? Now, we don't like that. Anybody sign up for that? No. He'll still discipline us. But see, I think the current intercession of the Lord on our behalf is the same as what he's told Peter. Is, Listen, I'm praying for strength and courage that you would endure, that you wouldn't give up. You ever wanted to give up? See, I think I, what I love about Jesus is our friend where Jonathan went out and pursued David, that Jesus pursued us as a friend, and he fully understands the temptations and the trials that we're facing today. Did you know that Jesus wanted to give up? Just like some of you. I love Hebrews 4, where it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we, want, we have one that's been tempted in every way. Talking about Jesus. That he is our high priest that's been tempted in every way. And even Jesus wanted to give up. See, some of you have gone through some stuff over the last six months, and you got Saul breathing down your neck trying to take you out. And you're at a point right now of going, You know what? Enough. I give up. I remember driving down the road on Highway 300 north of Spring Hill over in Longview. And it was about 25, 26 years ago. And I was driving in my Jeep. I've, I've had Jeeps all my life. And I remember I was driving in that Jeep and I was running away. You ever run away? And as I was driving up Highway 300, I was literally yelling at God. I was done. And I asked a stupid question. I remember yelling out to God, what else could go wrong? Don't ever say that, okay? <laughs> Don't. Okay, I've been arrested, fired, run out of town. Okay, anyway, um, and that was all post-Jesus. That wasn't pre-Jesus. Okay, that's later. But um, I remember hollering out in my Jeep. And I was about five miles north of town on Highway 300. And I don't know that I've heard the audible voice of God, but I know on that day, God spoke to me. And all God said to me, it was almost this holy moment. That, that, that song that we've been singing over the last few weeks, the goodness of God. That the goodness of God is running after you. Now, don't miss that. The goodness of God is running after you. I believe that on that day, the goodness of God landed in my Jeep because it was a holy moment where all I heard was, is go home. Go home. Because see, I, I think my Savior understood wanting to quit. And all I heard was, go home. And I remember turning that Jeep around and driving back to the house you see, a friend lays down his rights. A friend lays down his life. A friend intercedes for us. But here's the last thing. Look at 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18. It says, now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life. And here's Saul again, breathing down your neck. Some of you got some Saul in your life, don't you? Come out to seek the life while David was in the wilderness. And Ziph and Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horesh. Encouraged him and God. Thus he said to him, do not be afraid. 
because the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. And you will be the king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows this. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed at Horesh while Jonathan went to his house. So here's David again being chased by Saul. He's out in the wilderness, found out that Saul had not given up. Here comes Saul again. That's what sin will do. Sin's always going to pursue you, man, okay? That's why you got to understand this is why you need a savior. This is why you need to be in a relationship with him. Some of you got some Saul following you right now, amen? Just when you think you get past it, you're thinking, oh my gosh, here it comes again. I love what my friend John Randalls used to say. Hey, life's going to happen, amen? Some of you had some life happen this week, amen? Life's going to happen. And by the way, if life's not happening right now, be patient because life's going to happen, amen? That's the way life goes. Some of you have Saul chasing you down. And so here we have David once again running from Saul. Here's Saul trying to kill him. He's out in the woods. And Jonathan comes to him and he begins to encourage him. So here's my thought. Can you ever have too much encouragement? And really, think about this. Can you ever get too much encouragement? I was fishing this last week, a good friend of mine on the boat. And we were talking about parenting and we were talking about raising kids and, and they've got babies and they've got one on the way and our kids are a little bit older. And, and I told him, you know what? I could come home every day and I could find something wrong with every one of my kids. Amen? Come on, don't look at me all spiritual. You know what I'm talking about. I can find something wrong with Danielle. That's my wife, if you don't know, okay? I was telling my friend, I said, you know, I could go home every day and grit and moan at everybody in the house. How do you think that would go over? Okay? One, you'd be looking for a new pastor after about three months because she would kill me, amen? She'd just knock me off, go find another rich guy. And that, no, I'm just kidding. Um, she'd get rid of me. And you know what? Listen to me. You can never get too much encouragement. In fact, sometimes I, 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 I almost can't help myself with Danielle. In fact, I was telling her this morning of how blessed I am and how much I love her and how she's changed my life because that's what relationship does. It changes your life life. And sometimes I'll ask her, I said, do you ever get tired of me just blessing you? Because sometimes I just can't help it. Sometimes it just comes out before I know. It's like she'll walk through the house three or four times. I'm like, dang, baby, you're so good looking. Mm. She'll walk back down. I'm like, babe. She's like, shut up. <laughs> but she's like, come on, tell me more, right? Because can you ever get too much encouragement? See, here, here, here's a leadership principle some of you need to learn. What's celebrated is repeated. What's celebrated is repeated. Let me tell you what, G, what Jonathan was doing here to David when David was out in the wilderness. And very honestly, David's life was not fun right now. And so here Jonathan comes out and goes, hey, 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 listen, listen. You are the king. You're going to be the king. Don't forget about that. God loves you. I'm going to be right there with you. Don't forget who you are. You're a son of God. You're a child of the king, brother. Don't you give up, man. Come on. Get up. We're going to do this. I'm with you. Come on. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Some of you look at me going, is he mad at him? No. <laughs> Some of you forgot who you are. And you know what Jesus is doing right now on your behalf? That's mine, Dad. That's mine, Daddy. That's mine, Daddy. Oh, yeah, Daddy. Don't let him give up. And you know what he did? We're going to learn this next month. He's given you the Holy Spirit in you. And you know what the Holy Spirit's interceding on your behalf right now? You're a child of God. Goodness of God is running after you right now, chasing you down. I don't care how big your soul is. Jesus is coming after you, man. Amen? Don't forget who you are. Don't forget how you've been forgiven. Don't forget how much you're loved. Jonathan wins to David and reminds him of the promises he's received of God. And listen, you can't read the promises of God enough. On Thursdays, when I'm home studying in our office from the house, I'll finish up my sermon usually about 1 o'clock. 
And I'll usually retire to my garage. I love my garage. It's where I hang out. I got an old chair out there. Danielle calls it the grotto. I don't know what that means. Anyway, it's a garage. And I'll go outside and I'll read. And, and I'll be reading the book and I'll flip over and I'll start looking at scripture. And then sometimes I'll just stop. And I'll begin to stare off at the trees. And I'll begin to worship and have a conversation with God. And he begins to remind me of who I am. Edward, you're not who you used to be. You're not who you were five years ago. You're not who you were six months ago. That you're my son, you're my child, you're fully loved and you're fully forgiven. And sometimes I will literally sit there for an hour and just meditate on the goodness of God. Unless I know some of you don't have that. I know some of you don't have that much time. I'm telling you when, you, when you really begin to remind yourself and allow the king to remind you who you are, it changes you. It changes. And listen, some of you, when Danielle and I got married 17 years ago and we went to the Virgin Islands for our honeymoon, let me tell you what didn't happen. When we came home, we flew into DFW, I didn't put her on a plane to Tulsa because that's where she's from. I got her here as quick as I could, but um, I didn't put her on a plane. And you see, it would be easy for me to put her on a plane and, and then to live the next 17 years like I wanted to. Wear the ring. And if somebody asked me, hey, are you married? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm married. Yep, mm -hmm, I'm married. Got married 17 years ago. Where's your wife? Oh, she lives in Tulsa. How long do you think that would work? And yet, that's how some of us treat Jesus. Because some of you walked an aisle, you got baptized, but very honestly, you haven't talked to him since. And there's this false idea, and I'm not trying to create doubt, I'm just asking you an honest question. There's this false idea that if you walk an aisle and you pray a prayer, that you're saved. No more than I would be married just because I took some vows and then I sent her somewhere else to live a heart, her own life. And I live my life completely autonomous without consideration of who she is. And yet for some of us, that's the way we live our Christian life. And so here's what I would say to you. I don't need this to be married because I'm going to go home with her today. I'm going to wake up with her tomorrow. Amen? That's if God lets me wake up. I'm not, I may die tonight. I don't know, but I'm going to wake up with her and I'm going to have coffee with her in the morning. I'm going to spend the day with her. I'm going to spend this week with her. Why? Because I'm in covenant with her. And you know what? She's changed me. I'm a better man because of my relationship with her. And can I just say this to you, for you that call yourselves believers? What kind of relationship do you have with Jesus? And if you're depending on some date from 30 years ago and nothing has changed, it might be that you don't know Jesus or you don't know the Jesus I know. And so my question to you this morning is, do you know Jesus? Is he your friend? Has he called you friend? Has there been a time in your life where you've surrendered your life to him. And if not, today would be a great day for you to no longer be called servant, to be called friend. And some of you got some souls breathing down your neck. Understand, remember who you are. You are not who you used to be. You're a child of the king and you can overcome and you will overcome with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, amen? So let's respond. Uh, we're going to take communion. And um, I, I would ask you that as you take communion today, that you would think about the King of Kings that's invited you to be his friend and to be grateful today as we worship him by taking the body and the blood and the cracker and the cup and worshiping him. And this morning, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I would invite you to go to Grace Place. It's over here to your right, to my left. And there'll be some folks there that would love to introduce you to Jesus. 
that you could surrender your life to him. So if you don't know him today, we invite you to do that. If you know him today, then we invite you to take communion, to respond, and then we're gonna go out back and eat some barbecue and uh, hang out as a family, amen? Let me pray for you. So God, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, God, that um, even the Old Testament points to you. That God, even as we take communion, it's pointing to you. Not only to what you did, but that you're coming back. That we don't need to stand around and stare at the sky. That you have work for us to do, relationships for us to build. So that we would be ready, Father, when you do come back. So Lord, I love you today. I thank you for the opportunity to just be with my family here. And what we're about to see. God, would you fall on this place and break this place open in a way that would be beyond uh, anything we could ever dream or imagine. Father, I love you. As we take communion, maybe there's someone here that needs to surrender their life to you, give them courage. And God, as we go out back and fellowship and laugh and cut up, God, thank you that you created us to enjoy you and each other. I love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's take communion and respond, and then we'll be out back. Have a great week. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.